everybody. Welcome to Bootsy Vision. We're here with the one and only number one funk. And we're here to talk about the funk capital of the world. So, how is this album different from other Bootsy albums in terms of it's always going to sound good, we know that. But, you know, there's a concept behind that. Yeah. Can you tell the fans the concept behind that and why you wanted to bring that concept to the public? Well, um, the reason I called it, first of all, the funk capital of the world was because um, I was looking at not a place in particular, I was looking at the place within. Um, and that's why I always say wherever I go, the funk capital will be there because um, uh, you always take it with you. Uh, that's one thing you do take it with you. And uh, the funk capital is, um, for me, I have to look back and kind of look and see where I, I kind of got my funk from. And um, it started with uh, actually playing with James Brown. And, and so I wanted to uh, let people know uh, who influenced, where I got my influences and um, what inspired me as I was coming up in music. Not that these um, these are all the people that inspire me. It's just uh, a few of the main ones that really started it off for me. Jimi Hendrix, <coughs> James Brown, my brother Catfish. Uh, those were like the three um, uh, like solid you know people that I looked up to that uh, that really kicked it off for me. It started off with my brother Catfish, um, and so he was like eight years older. I looked up to him. I didn't have a father in the home, so um, he was he was that cat, you know. Um, and so it started from there. And I wanted to try to figure out how to get all of this into a record, along with um, people that I felt like still had a voice, a voice to the people, um, like Samuel L. Jackson, you know, uh, Cornel West, um, uh, Reverend. Uh, Charter. These people are not like so-called uh, artists um, that's out in the music business that, you know, but they have voices. And I felt like um, if I can kind of collaborate them and get them in the studio to uh, deliver these messages, this hope, you know, spreading hope like dope, you know, and for me that's, uh, it, it meant a lot to get that on this album. Uh, and that was the whole concept. Yeah. You've said before uh, for German television that you know with your music you hope to just have people have a getaway from their lives, not necessarily because their lives are miserable, yeah. but just to have an outlet, yeah. so, you know, yeah. release that tension and energy and just you know feel good. Yeah. Um, why is that so important to you to provide that? Because. Uh, I always felt like music made me feel good. Um, uh, it's kind of like the drug that, um, I guess it's kind of like a legal drug. I mean, music, I mean, you know, um, and it actually, um, you can get music that makes you feel bad, you know, uh, you can get any kind of music you want, but um, the music for me that makes me feel good is what I would like to give to people so that they could uh, feel good, you know? Um, and I think basically people really want to feel good. You know, uh, a lot of people just don't have nothing to feel good about. And so if you got some music that makes you feel good, if you have nothing around you that, you know, inspires you or makes you feel good about yourself, if you put on this one little tune, you know, uh, this one little song can uplift you um, and make you feel good about something. And that, that was the take, you know, the, the direction that I wanted to go. Well, someone that's historically done that is, of course, the legendary James Brown. Yeah. And, um, can because you, you saw it firsthand, how was he able, I mean, through his showmanship, his dance, his soul, of course, yeah. how did you see firsthand how he was just able to make people you know, forget their problems and just unwind and lose their mind. And my follow-up would be, you know, 
why did you want to do JB Still the Man, a song on that album? Yeah. <clears throat> well, you know, looking at James Brown from the outside was one thing. But being in the band with him and seeing it from the inside out was a whole nother take, you know. Um, I see him the entertainer, I saw him as the um, musical director. I also saw him taking care of business, which to me, you know, it's like I'm a musician and at the time I was coming up, business for me was like, <clears throat> I didn't want to have nothing to do with business. So all I wanted to see was the musical side. And he wanted to show me all the elements, and he did. Um, but the part that I liked the best was when he got up there felt good himself with what his, he was doing. And the band was tight, and everybody just made everybody feel good. And that was our whole purpose, you know? Uh, it's it's kind of like uh, making each other feel good because you hold your note. This guy got his note, he got his note, and everybody's playing their notes. And when you do that, you got this, this bliss happening. You got this friction, this good kind of friction happening that, that that's hypnotic, and it makes you, you know, uh, what's those things in your brain? The endorphins, yeah. Endorphins, yeah. All of that stuff, you know. Um, you don't have to take really LSD or to trip, you know. Um, when you play this music, that makes you feel good. It's like, wow, you know, and you, you know, you, you go into this other zone. And when you go there, it just makes you feel great. And everybody around you just feels that. And James Brown did that. And it was like, wow, this is what I want to do. You know? And one of my favorite songs on the album, Don't Take My Funk, yeah. Um, yeah. features, of course, the great boys of Bobby Womack. Yeah. And I believe, I know of Catfish, your Catfish, like brother's yeah. on it, but is that him singing at the beginning? Yeah, yeah. Um, actually, um, I had forgot about him doing a verse on there. You know, of course, he you know, he and I did the hook, but I had forgot he had actually put a verse on there because Bobby had sung so much. You know, I let him, you know, when we got in the studio, just, you know, just go for it, you know. And I had forgot that um, Cat had even did a first verse until I put the song back up before I mixed it. I was like, wait a minute. Wow, Catfish did a verse here. And I had to. I had to put that there because most people didn't know the catfish could sing, you know, and it was good. Can you talk about <coughs> um, the way you two played off each other in your music? And I'll, I'll give you an example from what I've heard. Um, I noticed a lot, whether it's, um, you know, what's my telephone bill with his 12 string, yeah. or if it's a song like Mugbush where you can hear his acoustics, but then you hear like the roar of your distortion in the background. Yeah. How did he, what was his, I'm sure it changed, but how did he input and play off you and how did you play off of him? Because I know you co-wrote a lot together of your songs. So, so what was your recording studio relationship like? We just felt each other. I mean, um, I don't know, it must have been like those twins. They feel each other. Okay. It yeah. must have been like that because we didn't have to talk too much. You know, Almost um, telepathy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I can tell what he's feeling, he can tell what I'm feeling, and we just start grooving, you know. Um, and it was just magic, it was magical, you know. Um, and we knew it, you know, we knew it. And you know, we knew every time we got together something was gonna happen. And I don't know if you noticed when we were talking today, um, Georgie would say, you know, when, when uh, Catfish and I got together, it was just magic. If I had a line um, and I would do the line, Cat would automatically know what to do, you know. Um, and it wasn't a whole lot of, you know, uh, let's figure this out. Uh, let's, it just happened. You know, it just happened. Yeah. You know, uh, and that's what funk is, really. Funk just happens. It's like um, you come in with nothing and you go out, you got something happening. You know, make it something out of nothing. 
Well, since you say that, and this is a concept album, did this just kind of come, or did you sit down one day for the first time, maybe in your experience of making albums, and say, okay, I'm going to really plan this one, or is it still kind of like the funk and it just kind of happened? Yeah, <laughs> it, always, it always has to happen. Uh, you know, um, I had the idea of, you know, I want to do the, the funk capital of the world, and I had no idea what that was. Um, and then you start recording a song, get through that song and then you start on something else and none of them finish you know you just start doing stuff and you start bringing people in and you start you know putting things together kind of like George's concept of bringing certain people in and uh, seeing what happens um, for me uh, that is so exciting because you never know what's going to happen Especially bringing somebody in that's not a rapper, you know, or you don't, you know, this is not normal to bring Dr. Cornell West in. What's he gonna, you know, what's he gonna do? You know, what's Samuel L. Jackson gonna do? Um, and how is that gonna, how are people gonna accept that, you know? Um, and so, you know, I kind of threw all of that stuff away. It was more about, okay, I got this, this song, uh, JB is still a man. And I know if I give that title to Reverend uh, Sharpton, he gonna take it and run with it. And so I knew that in my head. It was just, I didn't know the outcome, but I knew if I give this title to him, because he can feel that, he knows that JB is still the man. And um, a lot of people you can say that to, and they don't know how deep that is. But if I say it to Reverend Sharpton, he would know how deep that is, and he would take it there. And sure enough, I gave him the, uh, the title. He took it there, you know? Samuel L. Jackson, same thing, you know? Um, uh, Dr. Cornell West, I told him, uh, 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 how, how did I phrase it? I phrased it as uh, uh, people with having, people got smartphones and still making dumb decisions, you know? Uh, that's all I needed to say. Once I said that, he got it. You know, he was like, gotcha, turn the tape on. You know, um, and then the phone just rolled. I turned the music on, it's on. That's the way we did with George, actually. Um, George was so good at, when he hears, it could be just two guitars and a click track, you know? When George heard, heard that rhythm, he automatically just would come up with stuff. And that's the way we've kind of been used to working. Well, I, I'm glad you said way to my next question, which is about the song Freedom. Yeah, um, yeah. Obviously, you know, running a business or whatnot, it's nice to have easy access to your email and phone and whatnot with the smart technology. Exactly. But what do you think are some of the negative consequences of the smartphone? And just as an example from my experience, you know, I've seen it. People aren't as sociable, right. you know what I mean? Like they're more, not just secluded, but their interaction skills and charisma yeah. has gone down. Yeah. What, what is your take on that? And what do you think the positives and negatives are of this smartphone era? Well, um, I, would, I would have to say, um, you know, I guess the worst part of it is we, we don't uh, communicate um, with each other. Like if we went to dinner, jump on your, your smartphone and you start texting. Instead of vibing with each other, you know, you have your, your, little, you know, your little crew or whatever around you and everybody get off into their own little world. Um, and there's no um, playing with each other. You start playing kind of with yourself, you know, and you got this thing going on. And there's no um, communication. There's no feel for each other. Um, and it's kind of like uh, uh, being in a band and playing with yourself. Um, what's the purpose of being with a band if you don't actually play with the band? You know. Um, and I see that, that that's what's happening to most of us now uh, with smartphones. Is you know we're, we're all playing individually. We're not playing with each other. And that's not a 
that's not a human trait that's really conducive for us to grow as a community, to grow as a nation, uh, to grow as people, you know, uh, to grow together. Um, that concept separates us <clears throat> as people, as individuals, as, I mean, everything that we got to do with being human, it separates us, you know. Um, and I think it's time out uh, as far as being separated. You know, we're talking about bringing people together. Um, like we were with bands, but even more so. We're getting further away from that concept than I think uh, was more humanly thought of. And we're gonna have to deal, it's gonna be some serious consequences, you know? Um, and I don't think we really thought about that part of it. It's more about, oh, looky here, we got some new technology. You know, check this out, check out what you can do. And all of that's great, but there's always a cost. For every, um, what is it, every cause, every cause of action, there is a reaction, you know? Um, and so, you know, that's what's going down now, and nobody's really thinking about what the cost is gonna be. Um, and it's gonna cost us, you know? It's gonna cost us our soul, our life, our communion with each other. With each other. The community is like, <clears throat> down the tubes now, you know, and it, it can only do, uh, get worse because we're not playing with each other. Um, we're actually playing against each other, and that's, uh, that's not good. You once said, and this is kind of back to the band aspect that you were talking about, yeah. like you once said, it's a paraphrase, but uh, when you released uh, back in the day, The Best of Bootsy, you know, Your Greatest Hits yeah, with Warner, yeah. um, you once said that, you know, bands and instrumentation, people playing instruments, and getting paid for it, it'll help lower crime. Crime, excuse me. Yeah. Um, uh, have you seen that firsthand? And how do you think it makes people avoid, you know, the temptations of street life? People, people were made to be creative, and when you have, when you are forced to have to make money to uh, survive, that takes you more out of natural creative state <clears throat> and that puts you into survival mode which uh, is, is uh, it puts you into the thinking mode of what can I do to feed myself what can I do to pay this bill what can I do you know and that's not a creative um, it's not the creative experience that expresses yourself musically or creatively um, that, you know, forces you to do something that, you know, you definitely will regret in the end, you know. Um, but we have to do what we have to do. And if you don't have a choice, you know, then you go for it. You know, and most of us don't have a choice because um, a lot of us can't learn the system. Like, you know, it's easy for so-and-so, but it's kind of, it's really difficult for us. You know, um, but we're all lumped into this one thing and, you know, and said, go for it. Everybody can't be a, uh, you know, a, a C, B, or A student. You know, a lot of us is just Fs, you know. Um, and, um, you know, being an F is not, you know, it's not bad. It just becomes bad when you can't provide for yourself, you know, um, and then you look down at it and you, you know, you, you not, you don't belong, you know. But that's not true because, you know, uh, you, just because you don't know how to deal in the system, don't mean you're not creative. You might James be, Brown yeah. was a shoe shine boy, you know, but he's so creative. I mean, you, you look at all of this different talent that came up. Everybody wasn't a genius. I mean, like that, you know. Um, and so, um, you know, it's special kids, special people that not necessarily are up with the, the way the system does things or how the teacher would teach you to do things, you know. Um, uh, they just naturally have this ability, you know. But if we don't look for those abilities or if we don't open, have doorways to these different abilities, 
then I think as a, as a race, we lose, you know, um, because everybody's not the same. So in other words, like the classroom, sit at the desk for six, seven hours, whatever, that's not the format for everybody. Not but everybody. they might be an A in another realm. Exactly. Right. Exactly. And um, it, that, that goes in music, sports, I mean, in, in a lot of things, you know. Um, but we counsel it out because uh, it don't fit with what we want. I don't go with what we want, you know. Um, and um, you know, I didn't, I didn't go to school and learn music, you know, the way you suppose to learn music, you know. Uh, uh, but again, you know, I could bring something to the table, you know. A lot of kids that get counseled out, they can bring stuff to the table if they're allowed to, you know. Um, Self-expression, you know. Um, and, and so, but, <clears throat> but now. I think we're being fed so much junk uh, that makes a kid uh, not want to make somebody else feel good, you know, because he's not feeling good about himself, you know, um, and I think that's the number one um, uh, reason for all of this mess. We have to start trying to do something to make people feel good about themselves as opposed to making us feel like we're criminals, you know? Um, and I think, you know, all of that has a, a certain weight on especially a person that feels like he's not happening to anyone, you know? Um, it's kind of like, where is the hope, you know? Um, and then they go for the dope, the real dope, you know? So it's like, uh, you know, uh, that's what we call it. Final question is um, in regard to uh, the jazz greats. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's personally my favorite song on that album. Oh, wow. uh, it's beautiful. Wow. But um, you mentioned Herbie Hancock in there, yeah. and I saw him live, and he's wonderful. But my question about him and is related to Sugarfoot. I'm wondering if you can uh, a speak about your experience recording with Sugarfoot and Herbie Hancock for uh, Herbie's album in '88. Yeah. But also about Sugarfoot's legacy and how he was to you as a musician, but it was, you know, your relationship with him. Yeah. Well, Sugarfoot was, um, <clears throat> I guess I, I could say I had three brothers that was really that close. Um, my real brother, Catfish, Sugarfoot, uh, and Will Longmire, because they were all of the same age, older than I, and they were the ones that I looked up to. Those were the people that I could, you know, touch. You know, uh, it wasn't about radio, it wasn't about records, it wasn't about none of that. It was more about community, local people that I could vibe with, that I could get around and I could see, and I could watch, and I can like, you know. And uh, Sugarfoot was one that embraced me. Um, and a lot of older cats, when you're young like like I was, they don't embrace you like that. I mean, you know, especially like brothers. You know, um, you know, your brother, my brother, didn't embrace me until I proved that. You know, I'm worthy. You know, I mean this. You know, uh, I'm not joking this time. You know, um, but I didn't have to prove that so much with, like, say, like Sugarfoot and Wilbur Longmire. This drummer named Ranchi, they, they just, for some reason, they knew that uh, something was there, and I wasn't joking. Catfish was the one that didn't, he didn't trust, you know, he was like, uh, you know, I don't know, you know, so I had to keep wailing away at it with him. I had to keep, look, look, I'm, you know, I had to keep knocking at his door because he wasn't going for it, and that was good for me. You know, because it made me uh, not give up. It made me want to be that much more better. You know, and it made me practice harder. It made me uh, do all these things that would, in the end, make me better, a better person. Uh, I didn't know it then, but you know, I, I learned about that. You know, uh, shortly afterwards, it's like, wow. You know, my brother really don't hate me. You know, he's just, you know. He just didn't want to be bothered with me unless I had something happening, you know. Um, and, and older brothers are like that, 
you know. Um, and then, um, you know, Sugarfoot, I had had this relationship with him because as an Ohio player, he was in the Ohio players, and they were like so happy. You know, this was while, this was before I got with James Brown. They were like, they were like a band that was just off the charts. Uh, never seen nothing like it, you know. Um, and the shows that they would do, you know, he would always let me in, you know. Uh, he always was concerned about, you know, let Bootsy in, you know, he won't, you know. So they always thought that, uh, you know, I should see the show, you know, and I can't explain that, you know. Um, but I knew that uh, he was one that was always, you know, um, embracing me. Um, him along with Wilbur Longmire. Wilbur Longmire is a jazz guitarist who um, uh, allowed me to play with him, and I didn't know what I was doing, but he let me do some gigs with him in the very beginning, and to this day, I don't know what I was doing, but he liked it, you know, um, and he kept inviting me back to do doing gigs with him. So from that day on, he was like, wow, you know, somebody I always looked up to, to this day, you know. Um, and so that's, that's pretty much why I called him out on the, on the jazz grace on the album, because he's always been um, one of the greatest, as a matter of fact, uh, Benson, Wilbur was doing that stuff before Benson was even on the scene. But um, uh, Longmire, never made it in the commercial market like Benson did. So a lot of the people that um, uh, were like really great, but they just couldn't make it commercially, you know? Um, uh, and so I guess that works in, in a lot of different fields, sports, uh, boxing, you know, a lot of uh, athletes, you know, that are really great, they just don't make it in that you know, the NFL, the NBA, you know. Um, but so, uh, some kind of way, uh, you know, I kind of jumped from one and got to the next, and uh, Sugarfoot did too. Wilbur never really, you know, made that transition. So, um, you know, but uh, those three cats were like my cats, you know, for real. Anything you want to say to your fans, and what's Bootsy doing in 2013? Oh, wow. Um, 2013, we want to go out and funk the whole world up okay. in one shake, you know? Um, but yeah, we just want to get out and, um, and touch people again and let people know that the funk is still kicking. Um, and we just want to vibe with people and, and, and give them the essence of feel good feel good is about because we have forgot you know we have forgot about each other and I think the funk um, won't let you forget you know it won't let you forget and it reminds you you know it reminds you yeah we are human and we do have feelings uh, you know we just need somebody to touch them feelings we need somebody to stop so much alienating you know each other. We are all together in this. You know, we all on this mothership. You know, and um, let's have a funkin' party, baby. Thank you. Thank you. On the one. Yeah, yeah.